and uh, so we, we shall start with uh, Georgetown World Heritage Site, Sustaining History. Oh, can I see the slides here? I can't see the slides. Oh, okay, then I have to come this way. Is that okay? Because I need to see the slides. So um, it's basically, you know, the three criteria or the three values that Georgetown was listed for, history, heritage, and, you know, people, or intangible heritage, tangible and intangible. So this is uh, Georgetown. I think most of you have visited it. It's an old slide from 1980s. And the World Heritage Site is up to Komta and includes the, uh, the sea, the buffer. OK, next. How do I? Sorry. Is it? Oh, I point here. Oh, can I just down? Oh, here. I see. I'm pointing it. OK. So um, I refer to this person, Professor Northcote Parkinson. Uh, he says, history is a community's memory, and a community without history is like a man without his memory. Okay, he probably wrote this in the 50s. And he was Raffles Professor of History, University of Malaya, Singapore, and founder of the Singapore branch of the Malaysian His Historical Society. So I think it's very relevant that somebody who also coined uh, Parkinson's Law work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion, you know, should actually be, you know, telling us something about uh, um, managing history and managing heritage. Oh, th this is his other quote, delay is the deadliest form of denial. Okay. So, the historic cities of the Straits of Malacca, uh, they were inscribed on 7th of July, 2008, you have Georgetown in the north and Malacca, Straits of Malacca. And this is uh, Georgetown. You have the core zone in yellow, and then the buffer zone in pink. And uh, they're mostly vernacular buildings with some public buildings and temples and you know, religious um, monuments. And we also have like the jetties, which are like water villages on the east side. And these are some uh, facts of the um, area and also the number of buildings. I think the number of buildings may have been revised in the latest uh, special area plan. So heritage buildings are listed as category one, which means that there's no change of use, and also category two, which means that you can have adaptive reuse. So majority are category two. And you also have infill and replacement. So Georgetown is deemed to have outstanding universal value based on justifications corresponding to criteria 2, 3, and 4 out of 10 criteria contained in the operational guidelines for the World Heritage Convention. So the first one is, uh, you know, Georgetown as a, you know, like crossroads of civilization. Malacca as well, and a uh, meeting point of different cultures and, you know, a repository of multicultural her heritage, a palimpsest. So this um, idea of multiculturalism actually runs through all three of the uh, criteria. So these are the three represent exceptional examples of multicultural trading towns, uh, living testimony to multicultural heritage and traditions of Asia, and mixture of influences which have created a unique architecture, culture, and townscape without parallel. So uh, multiculturalism is, you know, ru runs through all three of them. Uh, the first is about history, cultural diversity. The second is about uh, you know, living, a living testimony, so people, commun the community, traditions, uh, tangible and intangible. And the third one is on about built heritage. So uh, this one is, okay, so I'm just uh, showing some slides uh, about the uh, uh, intangible, tangible and intangible heritage, and also about the built heritage. Because there's a particular mention of shop houses and townhouses. So I'm from the Penang Heritage Trust, and I can only have this kind of perspective from uh, an ad advocacy group. Um, Penang Heritage Trust was founded in 1986. It's a non-government organization, non-profit, and registered as a tax exam charity. So we have 10 councillors, 400 members. Uh, we have our own heritage shop house, and we are funded by membership and all that, just like the Singapore Heritage Society. So I'm the vice president now, the current president, Lim Gek Siang, she's here as well. And we have site visits. So this is a visit to the Jewish cemetery. And uh, 
we also have heritage alerts. So whenever, whenever anything is threatened or demolished, so we are the ones who cry out and say, you know, please stop. And, um, and sometimes we win the battle and sometimes we lose, but we hope to win the war. Okay, so this is our uh, website. It has a lot of information about us. And actually, we uh, started to talk about World Heritage you know, since the 80s, but it was in the 1990s where we kind of initiated you know, by bringing um, the UNESCO Cultural Advisor from Bangkok to, Pen to Penang. And then, uh, and then we also got Georgetown listed on World Monuments Fund. And then we have been lobbying the state government uh, since, since the 80s, actually. So our challenge is like to promote uh, cultural significance of individual buildings and also of areas and the city. And also to change the development paradigm and the tourism paradigm to convince government and investors of the economic value of heritage. So in fact, in uh, I think 1991, we invited Mrs. Pamela Lee to Penang. At that time, uh, you know, Penang government wasn't interested in heritage at all. So we said, look, Singapore is doing it, it must be a good idea. <laughs> and of course, they were doing it for tourism. But tourism is an argument that you can sell to the government you know, at that time. Uh, but now we almost regret that we use tourism because the uh, uh, other uh, impacts. Okay, so to build knowledge, legislation, institutions. So uh, this is, uh, you, you remember we're a grassroots movement. So it's very difficult from the ground up to do this. So in a way, we in envy Singapore for having your planning framework, your regulatory framework, which we do not have. I mean, we have a very weak one. And, uh, you know, if you had, we had that kind of institutional, uh, strong institutions, I think we could have, we could protect a lot more. So uh, to build knowledge, legislation and institutions on how to, pro how the know-how to protect and preserve heritage, even that, you know, we have to really kind of think about it and then talk to people and, you know, everything is from the bottom up. And then to foster identification with heritage among local people and youth. And then to create ownership and also transmit it to the next generation. So these are kind of like the five general challenges that we have. So in 1993, we managed to convince the government to have the first uh, heritage restoration project. Actually, it was Didier who convinced uh, the, the chief minister and the prime minister. And you can imagine the two of us were 23 years younger. Uh, and we were, you know, working on this. Um, and it's, it's not the end because, you know, uh, it has gone, in fact, a full cycle and it doesn't look as good as this anymore. But there is now a new possibility to do, do a catch-up restoration or catch-up maintenance. Um, and then after that, Didi went and he did this uh, roof for the uh, Achin Street Mosque. So this is the neighborhood where the Sait Latas Mansion is and where my, actually my office and, you know, somehow my roots are there, the Ku Kong Si. So uh, you can see that it's a very um, rich and multicultural kind of setting where the mosque and the temple are almost next to each other. The communities have coexisted. You know, you have religious trusts which uh, have coexisted and come under the same... Uh, uh, Br British uh, kind of legal uh, legal system. So there's there's a lot to study, you know, about the past, and um, it's it's a very diverse area. Yeah, and uh, you know, in fact, after uh, it, it was around two zero three where we fought a very difficult uh, battle to um, to keep the community in place, and we managed to keep I think half the community because they were going to be evicted and they were going to build flats around the mosque. And, and because there is a very small pocket left of the Muslim community, so it was, you know, I mean, it's, um, the, now the Georgetown is, it used to be much more diverse, but of course because of economic reasons, uh, the non-Chinese have been, you know, edged out over, not, not yesterday, but, you know, many decades or even the last century. And so, uh, so we, you know, uh, we, we thought that it was very important to keep the cultural diversity. And I think that they were very glad after that, you know, in 2008, that they were part of the World Heritage Site. So, and we have some uh, projects like the uh, Chong Fat Si Mansion, Suffolk House, and the Tiu Chiu 
temple, which have uh, been uh, recognized with UNESCO awards, uh, Asia Heritage Pacific Awards, yeah. Uh, Asia Pacific Heritage Awards, yeah. And, and uh, of course, we always ask the question, who built this heritage? Uh, of course, most of them were uh, traditional builders, Asian builders, um, not architects. But we did have, uh, from the 1890s, five architects that were affiliated with the uh, Royal Institute of British Architects. And they have given us uh, very good uh, prototypes and very good quality architecture. And they also trained uh, draftsmen, you know, so... Um, so then these draftsmen then also reproduce a lot of, I mean, they produce a lot of buildings with Asian um, kind of uh, influences. And uh, one of these uh, iconic buildings uh, is outside of the World Heritage Site. It's called Sunset, um, which is owned by a group, I think, now in Singapore. Uh, and they, they wanted to actually just keep that, that, little, that little part. Oops. This, just keep this and then demolish all of this. So we had an internet petition and managed to, you know, uh, get enough signatures. So the council then asked them to review and then they kept, they kept, uh, now they're keeping the whole building, but they're still building uh, 11 or 13 stories behind it. But I think one day they will thank us for having saved the building. <laughs> okay. So, and then this is another building, a judge's residence, which actually also, it's a shared heritage with Singapore because I think, I mean, it was built by a military engineer, a colonial engineer, and I think it could have been McNair, but I'm not sure. I mean, we, we couldn't find the name. And, uh, but uh, definitely it was where the governors of uh, the Strait Settlements, whenever they visit Benang, they would stay there. So from around 1900 to the 1920s or 30s, that's where the governors stayed whenever they visit Benang. So it's kind of a shared heritage. So, uh, heritage concerns, of course, in the past, heritage starts out by being concerned about preservation of singular buildings on, and ensembles based on aesthetic ar architectural values, etc. Uh, and there would be, I mean, in many countries, a kind of top-down heritage protection through the regulatory framework. And also, con uh, conservation is seen as part of a balanced development, which is, you know, it's necessary uh, but a balance, but you know, you still have to go on with the economic growth and urban renewal. And this is a kind of very nation state thinking, I would say. Um, but nowadays, we look at conservation of historic areas, which reflects multicultural values and intangible heritage. We also look at, um, I mean, there's uh, uh, expression of, or you hear the voices from civil society who you know, uh, thinking about local democracy. I mean, we, we should have a voice in the society, in the city that we live in. And then you see the emergence of like the citizen historian, the, you know, the cultural interpreter, the citizen archivist and all that. This, was, this came out in the presentation on Bukit Brown, which I attended uh, the last time I was in Singapore. And, uh, you know, we are the social memory of the city because we remember the city. So it is the, the people who, who have lived here I mean, we all remember different bits, okay? But we have to put it together. And we start to question the paradigms of development and growth. Uh, we, think, we start to think about urban resilience. It doesn't mean that you must grow as fast as you can, but you must grow in a way we, in which you can be resilient in times of economic crisis or, you know, climate change. So there are other larger questions, and you have to start thinking regionally. I mean, of course, you think globally, internationally. Nowadays, everybody does. But regionally, because we're part of a region, we, we always have been. And for that, you have to actually go back to before the nation state. You know, because we were a region and we, there was so much trade in, in the region with Bugis ships and all that. So, you know, we have to start thinking that way again. Okay. So, let's see. Uh, so this is uh, an old picture of Georgetown. It could have been, it could be any of the old pictures, but Basically, what you see is a historic cityscape. It is modern for that time. It's urban. It has connectivity. It has mobility. And as Didier would say, it's built with good materials. It's climatically appropriate. Uh, so it is a city of the future in some ways. And, and then for us, it's like, okay, it's built by our ancestors. You know, Akong, Ama built the city, right? 
and it expresses the genius loki and the cultural identity. So it's a, pl a place, you know, to live and to work and, you know, just live, right? And, um, you know, the, there will be a new part of the city which is built somewhere else, but we wanted to keep this old part of the city because it has so many things that you can still learn from, which, is, and you, which you, can, you can carry into the future. Okay. So before and after World Heritage Listing. Okay. Uh, we, we, you know, 2008 was quite a special year for Penang because we got a new government and then uh, increase in budget air travel. Our cruise ship terminal just opened and then, uh, you know, it was because of that, uh, there was kind of capital flow to Asia at that time. So a lot of pop there was a property boom and then there was a new trend in boutiques and cafes. So all this came together more or less in the same year. And uh, then what, what, you, what you started to see was uh, the, the World Heritage Listing was a catalyst because all the people who said that uh, heritage would suppress property prices then were pleasantly surprised. They said, oh, uh, heritage has value. You know, all the businessmen jump in and you know, everybody just jump on the bandwagon. So the, one of the first issues we had was that um, there were four rises which were approved before the World Heritage Listing and they were way too high. So it's something like, okay, the state says, okay, we are submitting this, but we're not sure whether we're going to get it. It's 50-50 or 30-70. And therefore, we shall just go ahead with development as if it's not going to happen. But when this, so they were kind of taken by surprise. And then uh, there were four projects which were already approved, which were going to exceed the height limits, which they said they would keep to, which is uh, 18 meters. So there was some uh, uh, intervention where, you know, the UNESCO people came and then they said, no, no, you have to keep to this 18 meter height limit. Okay, so uh, with the new energy of this World Heritage listing, and then we had uh, kind of some nice projects like 23 Love Lane, uh, and Gwyn is here, she worked on this. Um, and, uh, you know, slaking the lime and, you know, doing some archaeology and doing, you know, working with you know, artisans and all that. So we, we were hoping that things would go this way, that, you know, we would have more and more projects which were uh, more reflective and and you know, really focus on how the, bu the buildings were built and research into it and then you know, try to keep the quality of the, the workmanship and, and the, the whole, uh, you know, cons the concept of conservation in, in the fuller sense. So uh, the other one was the one that Gixian was involved in and this is the former medical hall which had to move out and it was also converted into a hotel. Um, and it was it's also done very nicely, the, the Ren Aitang. And uh, so uh, I think 2009 or 2010, there was a Georgetown World Heritage Incorporated which was set up and we all helped to set it up. Actually, all the NGO people, because we were the only ones who had any interest before and any knowledge of, about conservation. So it was the NGOs who actually helped to set up this government agency. Um, huh? NGI. <laughs> okay. And non-government individuals, okay. Uh, okay, who, who has to set it up? Okay, so uh, then they, they started to, it worked, I think, quite well at first. Um, and then they dropped this uh, special area plan with, uh, regarding height limit and envelope control. And uh, basically, uh, you know, laid out certain things about the typology, appropriate materials and quality workmanship and so forth. Okay. So these are, this is like the typology, which was developed by Tanya Wei and I think Gwyn as well, yeah. And then uh, this is in our special area plan. So if you have an infill development, it should actually conform to the lower. But it is kind of vaguely worded. It said it should conform to the lower, the height of the lower building, the lower height of the building next to you. But, you know, sometimes it's interpreted to be the higher one. And, you know, that happens, okay. And so you have things like that, which actually follow the guidelines, is it? Does it still follow the guidelines? No, okay. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's at that height and then it sets back a bit and it goes up. So we think it's not very, you know, it's not uh, ideal. I mean, it's, it's, it's not satisfactory at all, actually. So, um, and then that's another one over there. So it, it breaks up the roofscape. And then the other thing is there's a kind of still lack of control over building materials because cement is being used instead of lime plaster. But anyway, we started um, 
to be more in touch with the people who are working in the city council and GTWH. So now there is a kind of monitoring and heritage alert system, which kind of, it does work sometimes where, you know, we, we alert them and then they send the building inspector. But, you know, there's still issues like this where you know, there's no control over the colour. And then uh, I said, if you can't control the colour, at least do not make this, do not highlight it. But it is the heart of the street art market. So everybody comes here and then they go back to, you know, Taipei or, or China or wherever they're from. And then they said, oh, this is what we should be doing because George Nall is doing this and it's a World Heritage Site. <laughs> so we just, you know, I mean, what can we do? Because we have already complained and complained and complained. Uh, now, there is a kind of pilot project on Kimberley Street, six houses, um, where the state government says that they're going to do the restoration and then keep some of the traditional traits or allow some of the traditional traits to move in. So, uh, I, I'm not sure how it's progressing. I think you can ask Gwyn. Okay. So, <clears throat> understanding... Okay. Okay. So... Uh, in terms of the, you know, understanding and protecting the universal values, so I think I started with the built heritage. So now I'm, I'm talking about the one about uh, history and cultural diversity. Um, in, within Penang Heritage Trust, we have something called the Penang Story, where we kind of explore uh, the different historical connections, um, you know, of Penang. And uh, it has brought together a lot of people. We've had many rounds of it, actually. And, um, you know, it gives a lot of depth to the history. So, um, and, and I attended Singaporean Stories, which is ab absolutely delightful. I think they, they have really a good group going, and they're also doing it in Singapore. Um, so we have, like, themes like, you know, Dr. Wuliente, he went to, he's from Penang, he went to China, became a Manchurian plague fighter. Uh, there was a Javanese prince who was exiled to Penang. Um, Rabindranath Tagore came to Penang and, you know, and we also have uh, uh, Penang Botanic Gardens uh, which is um, you know, it's, has, it's related the history is related to the Singapore one um, and we, there was a speaker who also, also talked about Stanford Raffles you know, so we, we do you know, uh, m mention many things in connection with the straight settlements and I was, I was saying to I was saying to many of my Singaporean friends, we should have a straits conference. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, this building, which is associated with Raffles, uh, he built Runnymede. Um, some, some of it was destroyed in fire. It was kind of rebuilt again with some remnants of the old building. And that was just recently demolished because it was not identified in the inventory. And it was uh, then, you know, they had given planning approval years ago. And, you know, certain things went missing and you couldn't... <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, you know, we did, we did not have an opportunity to make a case for it. Um, and uh, we have also, uh, you know, like here you have the National Archives of Singapore. But there, uh, you know, we had to start with GTWHI. Uh, Gwyn is working on this visions of Penang, or she was. And, um, you know, to put as much as possible as we could online because we, we can't really protect them, uh, the tangible heritage, but we can make sure that they're available online. Um, so you have maps, for example. So this is a place where uh, anybody who wants to redevelop a property then goes to the website and they have no more excuse to say that they do not know what was there before. They do not know that this was an old building from the 19th century because you know, they can, everybody has access to this. Um, okay, and then, uh, so we, we uh, Her uh, Penang Heritage Trust was also involved in this uh, heritage management plan for the Christian Cemetery. And there are, actually there's a kind of demand now for heritage management plans. But the people who could do it are just too busy, and the people who can't really do it are pro usually get the job, I think. I, <laughs> don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> So, uh, okay, then, then we come to, okay, this, the, the intangible heritage, which is actually the most difficult, right? I think you have, you're facing this question as well in Singapore. How do you protect the intangible heritage? So, uh, one is the acknowledgement. So we, you know, this World Heritage Listing came with acknowledgement of 
you know, not just multicultural, you know, Malay, Chinese, Indian, other, you know, but also the colonial heritage because it says, and the European, you know, history as well. And we were very happy because before that we had to say, we had to battle and say that, okay, even though it's a colonial building, but it is still, you know, it is, the Asian workers worked on it and it's part of our heritage. But now we don't have to do that because it's already accepted, it's acknowledged. And religious diversity is acknowledged. So, you know, even the government people uh, now see everything as, oh, okay. Oh, there's five minutes only, okay. So, basically, um, so then we had to talk about intangible cultural heritage and we did actually two projects. And intangible cultural heritage, the definition comes from the declaration of, uh, of the Convention of Sa uh, Safeguarding Cultural Diversity, which I think the UNESCO World Heritage Site people and the UNESCO uh, Cultural Diversity people maybe do not talk to each other so much. It's a totally different convention, and you have to kind of imagine how one works within the other. So uh, there are, we have had inventories to map out uh, you know, traditional trades, artisans, and also festivals. So these are festivals. Okay. And uh, so one of the things that we face with the popularity of the World Heritage Site is the impacts of tourism and gentrification. So for example, uh, you know, these sisters who, um, you know, make, they are artisans, but they make things for religious, uh, like for a temple or festivals. So they had to move out because this place is now like for tourists. And uh, you know, an association over there on the, on the right hand side is now a, a party hostel, okay? which means it's, it, it, it thinks it can get out of registering as a hotel, you know, the, the, the guidelines for the hotel because it says it's a hostel. Okay? But we'll see. <laughs> And, uh, you know, even the clan jetties, which were places, I mean, where people live, and it was nice and very quiet to, you know, it's very nice to visit, but now it's very, they're selling tourist souvenirs. So, of course, we know that there is a tourism cycle, that this thing, the tourism may not last forever. I mean, you know, uh, the, the users get changed, people become dependent on tourism economy, and then after that, the tourists go somewhere new. Okay, so we know all this. Um, there, ha there has been a survey on se uh, census of the population uh, and of course it shows that from a population of 10,000 which was already quite low because after the repeal of rent control a lot of people moved out so even from 10,000 it has started to decline and then because of a lot of illegal conversions so now there's a kind of starting to check on, con on conversions uh, but uh, there's um, a lot of properties bought up by Singaporeans there's one Singapore property group that has bought up 200 over shop houses, you know, in Georgetown. And you know, how do you fight that? Because uh, there's no restrictions against foreign ownership. And, uh, you know, so who are we conserving for? Are we conserving for local people? Or are we conserving it as a playground for tourists and, you know? Okay, so, um, so how do we respond and what do we protect? So uh, I always say, Promote before you, I mean, protect before you promote. If you cannot protect, please don't promote. Please slow down on the promotion. You know, a profits from tourism should be channeled to conservation and community. And your policy and management must have a kind of information system. You know, it must be informed. You must make decisions based on, you know, how many residents are there, you know, what are the people benefiting and so forth. So you just ask this question, does Georgetown have a sustainable tourism policy? Does it have tourism management plan? Does it monitor tourism impacts? And of course, the answer is no to all of these. Um, you know, the, what, you, what they're interested in is like a, 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 a theatre set. You know, this is a theatre set. You can put a cathedral <laughs> at the end of our ministry. I mean, <laughs> you know, but what, what about the, the real life, the life behind the houses, you know? It, we are not a theatre set. Okay, so uh, there's a quote which you can't see here, but it says that, an invisible landscape conditions the visible one. This is from Invisible Cities. And it's really about, now we, are, we have to understand not just the city, but how it connects to the hinterland, how it connects to outside the World Heritage Site. Because that's what made it the heart of Georgetown. That's what it made, made it the centre. But we don't understand, we still don't understand that enough. And we are actually drawing all the life out of the, the city. So, uh, you know, there's still evictions uh, out, outside of... Uh, 
um, in, in and outside of Georgetown. And I refer to this, uh, uh, no, I think I have to skip this, uh, the, the idea of authenticity and integrity. So uh, Herb Stovall actually, uh, he talks about, uh, he gives an example of a waterfall. You, you, a waterfall is not a picture postcard. You can see a beautiful waterfall. Okay, you could have an uh, uh, electrical generator behind it, right? But you don't, okay, you have, you have to have your hinterland. You have a, a whole hinterland and ecosystem behind, you know, water catchment area behind this waterfall just to maintain the waterfall. So it's the same thing with the city. It is connected to everything else. And um, I think the UNESCO thinking has also moved from <coughs> authenticity as uh, meeting the, uh, the test of uh, design, materials, workmanship setting. Now they include traditions, techniques, management systems, you know, language, intangible heritage, spirit and feeling. Okay, so now this last image I shall leave you with, I'll go, go very quickly, is that the Prangin Canal, which we were very concerned about, and which was promised as a, and which is actually the rightful boundary of the World Heritage Site, because this canal was built in 1804 as a kind of defensive moat during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it's because of the French that we have it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, and these are some views. And the Prangin Market was actually promised as an uh, arts market. This is uh, the Prangin Market as it still is now. And it was supposed to be an arts district in a park because we really need a park at the edge of the World Heritage Site. Um, and the, the, the you know, archaeology had started and it showed that you know, there was another basin, maybe some of the original moats. And also, um, uh, kind of, it was used as a waterway to bring uh, all sorts of goods and even coffins and all that up to Carnarvon Street. So um, then suddenly we got this shock because there's a transport hub being proposed for the site. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the chief minister from Malacca. Okay, so um, the, in, the, in this transport plan, the, the tram is only the purple one, which is... Um, a tram that has to go there and come back, is, it, it cannot cross. Okay, time's up, okay. And then uh, three elevated monorails. So this is the visualization of the monorail, which would go into a transport hub. So this is now, you see, like, we thought that, you know, after World Heritage listing, all our troubles were over, we can rest. But now we have to face things like that, you know. So we, of course, we propose a, a modern tram. And, uh, okay, I'll end with this. Uh, the Cassandra was, uh, what do you call it, uh, cursed with the gift of prophecy. Okay, she has the gift of prophecy, but nobody will ever believe her, okay? So that's Cassandra's curse. And uh, so the cousin says, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it, and those who do study history are doomed to stand by helplessly while everyone else repeats it. <laughs> okay.